Hello, everyone. Well, it's the end of election week in the US, and I have some reflections to share. I've learned some things, I would say, and I even have a shameful admission to make and a new resolution. So listen through to, to the end of the video to hear that. First of all, I've been pondering the difference between voting politically and voting morally. And myself and a lot of other Americans were kind of like incredulous vis-a-vis uh, -vis people who voted for he who shall not be named. Um, <clears throat> how can you vote for someone with no moral character who's, you know, has no virtue and has, uh, you know, done all these immoral things? But many people I came to realize are voting politically, not morally. Many people are willing to vote for a candidate that they don't like and that they acknowledge has done morally problematic things uh, because of the political gain they think will come from that vote. So they may be concerned about this issue or that issue uh, they, they may believe this uh, candidate will foster less war um, or even prevent wars. And obviously, that's an important issue. Some people may be, you know, anti-abortion voters. Some people are single issue voters. Uh, there are many, many reasons that somebody might vote politically um, despite moral misgivings. And others just cannot bring themselves to uh, ignore moral character as, as part of the equation. And I guess I'm one of them. Um, I, I certainly could never uh, vote for someone with such a lack of moral character. But then people point out, well, the candidate on the other side, you know, doesn't have strong evidence of a, of a virtuous character either. Anyway, I'm not going to get into these debates. I just want to mention that these are different ways of voting. And we need to acknowledge that some people are going to vote politically and maybe they're right to do so. I don't know. Um, and and for others of us, we can't ignore our, our moral qualms. And some of those people, of course, didn't vote at all because they thought so little of the moral character of both candidates. But I want to move on to more important issues, I would say. Um, <clears throat> can someone with no moral character, someone who's perhaps even a narcissist, perhaps even a sociopath, perhaps even a psychopath, can can they be a force for good in the world? I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's an important question <laughs> to be asking. Um, so, you know, to turn it away from politics, we could take the example in the in the yoga world of someone like Yogi Bhajan, the the formulator or fabricator of so called Kundalini yoga, of the of the kind that's practiced in yoga studios today. Um, which of course has little to no connection with the kundalini yoga of the tantric tradition after which it is named. But this is just the same as the fact that Ashtanga yoga of Patabi Joyce has little to no connection with the Ashtanga yoga taught in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, right? These are just names that get used um, and people, some people naively imagine <laughs> that there is a connection to the actual pre-modern tradition that had that name or the, or the pre-modern body of practice that, that was subsumed under that name uh, when that's not the case. Anyway, the point is, um, there's, this is an interesting question to ask. Is the practice taught by Yogi Bhajan and, and formulated by Yogi Bhajan tainted if he himself was indeed a psychopath. And of course, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that he was, or at the very least, uh, a, a materialistic, greedy, um, 
sexual abuser, rapist, um, uh, uh, opportunist, etc., if not an actual psychopath. So is the practice that he formulated inherently tainted by that corrupt character? Um, some people would say yes, and some people would say no. And I think this is an interesting kind of moral and philosophical debate, right? <laughs> There's this idea, which uh, I think comes from the Bible, by the fruit, you will know the tree, meaning if the fruit is good, then the tree is good or good enough, the source, you know? Um, and that's, I think, a problematic conclusion. Right? If if you had beneficial effects from uh, uh, Kundalini Yoga as taught by Yogi Bhajan, I think it's dangerous to conclude that therefore he was a great man, therefore he was a saint. Um, Still, the question remains, could he have been a, a psychopath and still the practice itself is still beneficial? Could he have been a force for good, even though a psychopath? And obviously the same question could easily be applied to uh, politicians who shall not be named. So I don't know the answer, but um, there is the the idea in some traditions, uh, that if the root is corrupt, if the root is tainted, then all the fruit will also be tainted, perhaps in very, very subtle ways. And I think if I look at the evidence of um, the practice as taught by the inheritors of, of Yogi Bhajan's empire, I, I think I would have to side with that latter view um, a little more strongly. But, you know, I'm not making any certain conclusions. Uh, this is an interesting thing to contemplate. And then the question of could the practice be rehabilitated in such a way as to be beneficial, even though its progenitor um, was corrupt. And and yes, he was the progenitor, by the way. He, he didn't, this, none of this comes from the pre-modern period, um, apart from some of the Sikh mantras, of course. But anyway, what is the role of virtue in our society and in our spiritual communities? I feel concerned about the fact that um, a very cynical view of society and culture and politics is prevailing these days. And that view is uh, everyone's just in it for themselves. Everyone's after power, money, and influence and the things that power, money, and influence can get them. And therefore, nobody can be trusted if they're, you know, speaking about <laughs> things like spirituality and virtue. Of course, I've just stated the most extreme version of that cynicism. And I know that everyone listening to this video does not have the most extreme version. And yet, you have likely been touched and even affected by that by that very cynicism and you're you're likely to be skeptical of, of any claims uh, that that there are forces in operation in this world that might be as powerful as those um more craven human impulses and let's just remember that populist leaders authoritarian leaders autocratic leaders want people to believe that there is no truth but power they that those beliefs are to their advantage those beliefs make it easier for them to seize power because if there is no truth but power then you want a strong leader you want a strong man uh, to protect you but if that's not the case then you might want a virtuous person right and and of course this is the view in some pre-modern cultures, including India, that the ideal ruler is a person of great virtue. And not just in India, it's there in the in the Judeus, uh, uh, Jewish tradition as well. Um, the figure of Solomon, for example. So personally, I do advocate for a return to virtue. And I'm contemplating how that is going to manifest in my own life as well. Um, 
I think, you know, a modern cynical sensibility that scoffs at virtue or the attempt to cultivate virtue is perhaps the most dangerous thing in our society because we need to cultivate virtue to survive. <laughs> we need to cultivate the great virtues. Uh, and obviously, you know what they are. Love, compassion, kindness, gentleness, decency, straightforwardness, like lack of deviousness, and so on. Those virtues which we study in depth um, in my 21 Day Awareness Challenge, which I offer at the beginning of every year. And uh, I'm, I'm feeling the significance at this point in time of emphasizing virtue even more, and that the, the cultivation of it can be a powerful force. That the virtuous person is not a weak person necessarily, right? It's, it's not the case that someone who cultivates virtue is necessarily weak. Uh, in fact, virtue can be a source of great strength as the tantric yamas and niyamas teach. So more about that uh, somewhere down the line. Um, I also want to turn now to the issue of polarization because this is not just a political issue. Uh, this is a cultural issue as well. It, it's not just infected our politics, it's infected our whole culture in the US and in many other countries too, right? Uh, whether it's Brazil, whether it's uh, countries in Europe for sure, um, India, you know, other countries where where the populace is polarized in some of those places, of course, whoever's in power um, suppresses the 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 other side suppresses the speech of the other side unfortunately that's been happening a lot in india um but anyway the point is polarization is is happening all over the world um i, I think it's primarily a function of the algorithms of social media which have learned uh that that outrage um generates more attention and it's of course an attention economy in social media um, the more attention you're giving to the social media, the more ads you'll see. And so ad advertisers will pay more money if the platform can show that they have this much attention, this many eyes on. And the best way to get attention is outrageous claims and things that get people riled up and upset. And, and so that has driven polarization, as many other commentators have, have explained at length. But it's not just a matter of that. It's it, There's something else going on that I call epistemological decoherence. And that refers to the fact that our sources of knowledge are increasingly disparate, not overlapping. This is, of course, really different from 50 years ago or 30 years ago when people were mostly absorbing the same news and then debating about it. Now people are getting information or or misinformation sometimes even disinformation from widely varied sources that sometimes might have no overlap in terms of the facts they present and in terms of the opinions that they present so that creates this this epistemological decoherence and that of course contributes to polarization because then people can't find a common ground. They cannot find a common ground. And I see it on social media, for example, you know, countless people uh, who are who are um, voting blue flabbergasted that so many people could vote red. And so many people who who vote red are absolutely astonished and in disbelief that those voting blue could fall for the propaganda that they supposedly do, uh, and and also vice versa. You know, the point is again, I don't want to get too much into politics because I see this as more a cultural issue. It is a huge cultural issue. This this po polarization, and if there's no common ground, you just cannot imagine how people could hold the other view. Um, and we see that vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East war. We see it vis-a-vis -vis many many issues. Okay, what you know. How do we address this? Well, first of all, let's acknowledge we have a huge problem, which is that all our media sources and information sources are profit-driven. 
And that creates bad incentives when it comes to information. So uh, I, I don't see a solution as long as media is profit driven. And let's take the case of podcasts that are free. I mean, some of them are paywalled, but many of them are free. Well, but <laughs> podcastistan, as some people call it, is absolutely shot through with bad incentives. Because even if the podcast is free, it's free usually because of advertising. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's, it's um, getting paid by one or more kinds of advertisers. And that means that the podcaster is very concerned with followers. How many people are they reaching? Because if they reach more people, they can make more money from the advertisers. And if they're concerned about how many people they're reaching, that's a bad incentive that results in what's called audience capture, where the views of the podcaster get more and more and more skewed by whatever their audience wants to hear. And this can even happen in extreme ways where the where the podcaster gets radicalized by their own audience um, because of course the the survival instinct is incredibly strong they they want to survive they want to make money they want to have a have a good life in terms of what money affords right um, and so they they end up without even realizing it um, getting captured by their own audience. And so there's bad incentives there. So whether whether the profit is coming, you know, what, if there's profit involved, <laughs> uh, if there's money involved, that's a bad incentive. And of course, how is it not going to be involved? You know, universal basic income for all podcasters, so that they don't have this uh, issue. I don't know. <sighs> Then there's the problem on top of all this of propaganda, which is a huge force in, in, in modern society, right? So um, covert political actors are propagandizing in, in, in a whole lot of covert ways. Um, there's, there's a website, I think it's called Follow the Money. That might not be the right name, but it's, it's really amazing investigative work where they look into oh, where, where's the funding coming from for this or that speaker, this or that uh, a talking head, uh, this or that news source. And it's amazing because they expose, oh, there's dark money that, that it, there, and there's influence. Even if people aren't getting paid to say something in particular, there can be much more insidious and, and more subtle forms of influence. Um, and again, this this has to do with the problem of information dissemination for profit and the bad incentives it brings appearing in another way. Um, there's more to the issue. But suffice to say that uh, you really have no idea if the source you're listening to is not captured by these bad incentives. Now you might say, oh, but I read independent journalists on Substack. No, those independent journalists are often getting money from undisclosed sources. I could name names, but I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't name names in this video. Um, so, but, but the, there are no independent sources per se, right? Um, so we have this problem. How do we know what's true? It's a big problem. It's the epistemological decoherence um, and, and breakdown of our times, which might be the thing which destroys civilization as we know it, right? Because if we can't ag agree that climate change is happening, if enough people can't agree, there's no action which is, of course, is what exactly what we're seeing. Um, I mean, we would have to agree that it's happening, that it's going to be catastrophic, and that human action can mitigate that, that, those catastrophic effects. There's multiple things we would have to agree on to take um, action on a huge scale, and people don't because epistemological decoherence. You know, it's, so I'm just trying to point out that this problem is not just a political one, it's one that could result in um, 
the fall of civilization as we know it. I'm talking in 50 years and 40 years and maybe in 30 years. Um, and it may not result in that. It may not. <laughs> okay. But it's possible that it does. Um, and, and not just on the issue of climate change. There's many, many, many issues that people are not agreeing on because they're not agreeing on anything. And this raises the kind of fascinating question. Well, wait a second. If we are progressing as a civilization, as a species, why are we less good at communicating than ever before and less happy on average than ever before? The, the obvious answer is that we're not. We're not progressing. And this, uh, you know, pipe dream of <laughs> the evolution of the species um, goes out the window, you know, apart from in the, in the, in the strictest biological sense of that, of that term. Although there's some argue that even that is not happening, but anyway, we need innovative and radical solutions. And, but more importantly, the willingness to embrace innovative and radical solutions, which of course, current governments do not have, or, or this, failure to agree on everything that matters will certainly be um, our downfall. And I, I'm not being so catastrophic. I'm not saying the end of the species or whatever. No, if, if, if civilization as we know it crumbles, we'll, we'll just go back to a simpler way of living. Of course, a lot of people will die in the process and it'll be really grisly. Um, but that's also nature. That is what nature does periodically. And we go back to a simpler way of, of, of living and we're not globally connected anymore, right? And who's to say that that's bad? You can't possibly know that. Which, okay, finally brings me to my, my shameful admission. Um, okay. <laughs> so, in high school... Way back in the early 90s in Seattle, uh, you know how in, in America, the, the people vote um, in their graduating class, their senior class, they vote for who is, you know, Mr. Most likely to succeed and who's, you know, Miss uh, Prom Queen or, or most popular or whatever. Silly things. I don't know if they do it anymore, but back in the early 90s, they still did this voting for, you know, um, different titles to bestow. And in my high school uh, graduating class, I was indeed voted Mr. Know-it-all. And <laughs> that's because I like to argue and I liked to be right. And I, 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 realized that this was a problem enough that when they, when they came to take my picture, they're like, we need to take your picture for the yearbook because you've been voted Mr. Know-it-all. And I was like, okay, I need to do, I need to do something self-mocking to, to acknowledge that this is not <laughs> a thing you wanted to be voted. So um, I, I, I had my picture taken standing in a garbage can. Anyway, the point is, it has been a long, long, long process of many, many, many years um, to, to slowly get less emotionally invested in being right. And the, of course, it was key for me when I encountered the spiritual teachings of, of, of non-dual tantra and other traditions that taught um, that we can't be sure about much of anything, that embracing uncertainty is one of the most authentic and real things we could possibly do as human beings. And I realized that is what I, I needed to do. And I, you know, I've been doing it for many years, but it's a gradual process. And I acknowledge, you know, looking back on uh, what I've said about politics and what I've said about many, many issues, um, that my commentary hasn't always been as clean as it could be because of this lingering attachment to being right. And more importantly, perhaps than that, my engagement with people, the way I argue with people <laughs> about the issues um, is, is tainted by that attachment. It's way less than it used to be. Of course it is. Um, 
but you know, still there enough that I want to call myself out on it and resolve to embrace the truth of uncertainty more than I have before, which is exactly what the spiritual teachings invite. Right. So, yeah, I, I even though I feel relatively sure <laughs> that the moral moral character of the of the candidate who just won the U.S. presidential election is is is, is corrupt or or at least absent, that doesn't mean that his victory is the worst possible outcome. I don't know that. I mean, maybe it is. I have, but I can't know that. Maybe for the long-term course of history, that his victory is better. Uh, and on what basis am I saying better? Um, on the basis of the potential for greater flourishing and greater well-being for conscious creatures, for, for humans and other conscious creatures. So that's whenever I'm talking about better or worse, that's what always what I'm referring to. I, I don't think there's better in an absolute sense, but I think relative to the well-being of conscious creatures and human flourishing, there is such a thing as better. Of course there is. Uh, and, and for all I know, um, the way the election went is better or will be better, not immediately, but in the longer term. Who knows? I don't know. The thing is, admitting, you know, that, that, that I've had this attachment that, and that it's tainted the way I've argued with people and that I want to embrace uncertainty even more than ever before, saying that doesn't it doesn't eliminate the truth that 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 some things are more probable in life than others meaning to say we think about things in a way too much of a binary way uh, being right or being wrong as if it's that simple and of course it's not you know it's like we can oversimplify for the sake of of some goal and say oh i was wrong there but in almost every case where we were wrong, any of us, there was a grain of truth in what we believed. Not always, but sometimes, oftentimes. And almost every time that we're right, there's nuance there, right? We're not entirely right. And, and so when we're assessing something, like, is this the case or is this not the case? Let's remind ourselves that if we're thinking in a binary term, we're not thinking accurately and we're not thinking clearly it's never a matter of is this the case or is this not the case it's a matter of to to what extent you know how strong is the probability that this is the case and so i think not enough people including me um factor probability in meaning to say we we just get caught in these binaries and media and social media of course are, are complicit in this and we need to think in terms of uh, probabilities more because even though everything's uncertain and you really can't be sure of anything uh, apart from death of course you still got to place bets in life you still got to bet on something you know so it's like in an election for example you, you vote because you're you're placing a bet. I I'm betting that this candidate will be better than that one. But if you acknowledge that you don't actually know for sure, you're going to be less emotionally um, caught up in the drama. The drama that again the media and social media is complicit in feeding. But we need to start opting out of the drama because this is a vicious cycle. Okay. And yet you still got to place your bet. You still got to vote. You still got to, you know, bet on something in your life. Like when we when we choose a partner, we're, we're placing a bet. When we um, make a move, when we choose a career, when we when we choose anything, we're placing a bet. This will be better for me than that, I hope, <laughs> probably. And this will be better for the world than that, probably. We have to place those bets, and those bets should be informed by as many facts as possible, as well as by our innate intuition. So I'm, uh, what I'm advocating for, for myself and for you, is 
that embracing uncertainty, embracing the fact that you you n know that you don't know, you m might have a hard time admitting it, as I often have in the past, but deep down we know that we don't know anything for sure. And we can embrace that while still placing our bets. It's just that if you're embracing the uncertainty, you're, you're, you, you place your bet with less fear and less attachment. And that is obviously key now more than ever. What, what can we be sure of? Well, I said before I said death, but that's vis-a-vis -vis the future. We can't be sure about anything in the future other than the fact that we will die. These, these bodies and minds will die. And everything else is, is up in the air and open to question. And in the 21st century, more than ever in human history, that's the case, that we have no idea what's going to happen. But there's also the question of um, what can you be sure about now in the present moment? And of course, the answer is just that which you experience wordlessly, meaning to say, I'll, I'll speak for myself, what I can be sure of is the experience of my own being. And shouldn't we pay more attention to what we can be sure of? Notice, when we accept the fact of death, we live better lives. If we accept that we will die sooner than we would like, we live better lives. We prioritize what really matters. So there's something in the pattern here. When we pay attention to what we can be sure about more, then it improves our lives. Now, there's very little we can be sure of. Yes, that's true. But if we pay much more attention to that which we can be sure of, there's going to be immeasurable improvement in our lives. And in terms of present moment experience, I, I can be, what I can be sure of is all wordless. It's wordless experience, right? It, what I can be sure of is not the opinions in, in my head. <laughs> it's not the thoughts. It's not the predictions. It's not the framing. Uh, it's not the stories. What I can be sure of in the present moment is that which I am wordlessly experiencing. So, interestingly, our culture and our society doesn't put any value on that which cannot be described. And yet, that's what has the most value. Again, there's this amazing, beautiful irony, <laughs> right? That which cannot be monetized is that which is most valuable. And if we put more attention on what's most valuable, then our lives improve immeasurably. So what am I talking about in practical terms? Well, what people call meditation, it's, you know, the word itself has become compromised now, but it, communion with your own inner being, communion with that which is immediately true before you have a thought about it, right? Communion with your direct experience, which is uh, unarticulatable. Yes, you can try to articulate it, and and you can only ever partially succeed if you succeed at all but as it presents in each moment it's inarticulatable right we we make a story about it later for the purpose of trying to connect with other people and so on but experience itself the raw experience of existence of your own being is ineffable and that's exactly why it's given no value in a in a society that's all about um, thoughts and ideas and opinions and monetizability. But what if we give much more attention to that which we can know for sure, our real, raw, present moment experience, and what we know for sure is coming in the future, which is death? How, how does that change things? This is what I'm sitting with, and I hope you sit with it too. Thank you for listening.